God morning, everyone. It is time to go deeper into Matthew chapter 9. We got a few things we're going to talk about. The bridegroom, the wineskins, the mourners in the pipes, and praying to the Lord of the harvest. Chapter 9, verse 14 and 15. Then John's disciples came to him and asked, How is it that we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast? Then Jesus answered, How can the guests of the bridegroom mourn while he is with them? The time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. Then they will fast. All right, number one, that is a prophecy that he will be taken from them. But Jesus calls himself a bridegroom, all right? And the Bible throughout says we are the bride of Christ. You'll find a lot of that in Revelations. You'll find some repeats in Matthew and Mark. But like in Revelations, or, or you know, Jesus talks about also, Jesus talks about the wedding banquet, all right? Now, so we are, men and women Christians are, the bride of Jesus Christ. He is our husband. So when you see the way God speaks about a husband and wife, you can see how he's talking about our relationship to him. That's why he's not a big fan of adultery and fornication. Now, the reason he presses this, we are the bride of Christ and Christ is the bridegroom and we're supposed to be uh, married to each other, you know, husband and wife, and be faithful, is Genesis tells us we're created in God's image in his likeness, okay? Now, for the Trinity fans, you got the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. All three always existed. All three are God, right? All three are one God. They're not three gods. So here's what you have. You have the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, all right? Individuals, but they're one. He tells us we should get married where the two individuals become one. He's trying to get us to understand the relationship that he already has. Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. He wants us to have that with our husbands or our wives. Okay? And we are the bride of Christ. Excuse me. We're supposed to have that same relationship with God. He's uh, Jesus. He's supposed to be our husband. We're the wife. So when you read the scriptures and you see how husbands and wives are supposed to treat each other, that's how we're supposed to treat Christ. Um, that's why God calls us, like in the Old Testament, you adulterous nation. You're cheating on me again. That's why he says, I'm a jealous God. Just like a husband or a wife would be jealous if their mate was cheating. Okay. Um, and when he talks about being jealous, he's talking about humans worshiping other gods, right? You know, karma, worshiping idols, things like that. Okay, now the wineskin is chapter 9. I hope you, got, I hope you like that. The wineskin is chapter 9, verse 16 through 17. No one can sew a patch on an unshrunk cloth. Excuse me. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch will pull away from the garment, making the tear worse. All right, so that's number one. You don't take a new new piece, put it on there, because it, it just won't work, right? Um, and, and it will do what it says. It'll tear, tear off. But then he says, neither do people put new wine into old wineskins? If they do, the skins will burst and the wine will run out and the wineskin will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins and both are preserved. So you take a wineskin, you pour wine into it. As it ferments, it expands. You could drink that, do whatever. If you pour more new wine into it, when it expands, it'll bust because it can't expand twice. So when Jesus is talking about putting a new cloth on an old garment or putting new wine into an old wineskin, he's talking about the New Testament, the new covenant. He says you can't put that in the container that held the old one, the Old Testament, the old covenant, the old promise, the old commitment. 
all right? You can't put a new piece of cloth from the New Testament, all right, from Jesus on the old. You can't do it. Now, this thing where, where this uh, synagogue leader, his daughter died, and he said, Jesus, this is in Matthew 9, 23 through 25. He said, my daughter died, but if you just come and, and, and uh, what, what do you say? Um, uh, but if you come and put your hand on her, she will live. Then Jesus got up and went with him. Okay. Then they take a quick break and then they go down here to 920 to 22. It says, just then a woman who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. And she said to herself, if only I touch his cloak, I will be healed. Jesus turned to her, take heart, daughter, your faith has healed you. When we go into the prayer portion, that'll be two videos from now. We're going to talk about the fact that Jesus, that people are getting healed through their friend's faith, through believing or touching his cloak. He's not talking to him. He's not touching him. But so when he goes to the synagogue leader's house, it says, when Jesus entered the synagogue leader's house and saw the noisy crowd and people playing pipes, he said, go away. The girl is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took the girl by the hand and she got up. Now, again, the reason people would hire mourners, people to come and be sad when someone died, if you didn't have a lot of family members. So that's who he was talking to, these people that were hired to be sad. So get out of here. And that's why they laughed. You don't laugh at your grandchild's funeral, all right? Um, but I want you to see there that he told them to leave before he went and raised her from the dead. Jesus does that often. He will make the unbelievers leave the room. Those without faith leave the room. That is key. A lot of times in prayer, you just need to move the unbelievers out so that the believers can pray. You'll see it in scripture. Don't just take my word for it, please. Now, at the end, Jesus said, when he saw the crowds, this is Matthew 9, 35 through 37. It says, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to the disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Those that are to be saved, unsaved, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. That is people out preaching the gospel. So I often, for, for family members and friends, um, if I'm praying for their salvation, for them to know Christ, I pray to the Lord of the harvest to send more laborers out there. We're going to touch up more on that when we pray. And I'm connecting some of these videos together. We're going to do it for a couple times, see what happens. But any second, a Bible verse in a rhyme video is going to pop up. And you make a godtastic day, everyone.